All right, welcome back. I've been uh, gone for a few days here, real world, real life. Um, but back, and uh, now we're shifting to our next game series. Per the poll I did earlier, I think a week ago, everybody said, let's go with SCS North Africa. And then second place was the Victory Series, so uh, we'll keep that in the hopper too as next um, and go from there. So I've already done the unboxing of my copy of SCS uh, Standard Combat Series North Africa from Multiman Publishing. Um, yeah, this falls under the Standard Combat Series. They've also got some other series. We'll see that in a second, but uh, we're looking at North Africa, and actually this is listed as uh, Operational Combat Series DAC. They have a monster. I think that's that's Africa Corps, or DARE, I don't know my there, but they now made an SCS that covers all of North Africa from Operation Compass to, I believe, El Alamein. Um, and so that's what we're going to be looking at today. The goal is to do a rules review of both SCS and specific rules to North Africa. Uh, but before we get started, real quick, um, here is an excellent resource if you're playing any of these X the Gamers series, well, Battalion Combat series is new, but all the games, Standard Combat, Battalion Combat, Operational Combat, Tactical Combat series, uh, all these series, you've got a bunch of cool resources online at gamersarchive.net. Um, and I'm just going <coughs> to drill down the Standard Combat series, and you do have the latest rules as of... September 2015, version 1.8. These rules have been around for a while because they've probably very refined. These are the general rules for all of these games. And the cool thing about this series is, well, this is a kind of not too complex set of rules. About eight pages for the general rules. We'll see specific rules we're going to use are seven or eight pages, so it's manageable. And a lot of coverage of World War II, but there are others. Here's World War Three. Here's the Israeli Arab-Israeli War. This looks like World War One. So they've got a sprinkling of and that looks like Spanish Spanish Civil War, and this one looks like World War One. World War One. So they've got a bunch of games here. So by learning this standard combat series, you get the base rules for all these games. You just got to learn the. Uh, Specific rules for each one, and I hear Rostov 41 is a much liked one. I have Iron Curtain Day of Days, Heights of Courage. I have the Mighty Endeavor Expanded Edition. I uh, may pick up some more, so I may be looking at more of these here. So, this is a good resource. Other resource I'm going to use, obviously, is the Vassal Mod on the Vassal site. You go to Modules. There is one for this game created re relatively recently. Latest version is. Um, September of last year, so that's good. Uh, so I've downloaded that, and we'll be looking at that. And as usual, the BGG site has some stuff. Um, I haven't really gone through all the conversations yet. There's like 61, but I do look at the file section to see if there's anything to help. There's two things here I could use. Standard combat system real rules reminders, quick start gate for the rules. Um, obviously, I can't deal with foreign languages here on these. And then there's some other interesting things here. It's just it's Microsoft Publisher, I think, and I don't have that installed right now. I may look at these later. But I did pull down the two PDFs here, Rules, Reminders, and Guides. So I may look at that, too. So with that said, that's all of uh, kind of the resources we're using here. But yeah, the big two are Gamers Archive and the Vassal Mod. So... That being said, let's move on here. I've got both of those up here to help us in our rules review. And you do see here's the Vassal mod. I've got the first scenario up, so it's not the full monster map. Um, it only goes a certain space here. Maybe I'd zoom it out here. But very good uh, recreation of the game. Map looks the same. Crowners look the same. So uh, this looks promising. A bunch of cool stuff up here we're getting it to use. There we go. Zoom it out a little. So, yeah, this is the first scenario we're playing here. Operation Brevity. I'm going to have to go to my resource book to get the background on this one. I, I do know here... Oh, look! O'Connor. Captured. Oops. That was, uh, they say, the best British commander, and he inadvertently got captured. 
in the midst of his success. So let's come over here and what we've got, actually I'll start here, here is your standard combat series version 1.8 latest rules as far as I know. If not, please feel free to correct me. These rules are series standard to all those SCS games we saw on the Gamer Archive page. And um, just going through the rules here, kind of like to highlight the stuff that's you know, they talk about how to learn the rules, hex numbering system, uh, off-map movement. And again, remember, these rules are g general series rules, not specific to North Africa. Again, another rule set um, for that, which we'll look at. Playing pieces, uh, you can kind of skim this stuff, set up notes. Uh, the second moving player always sets up first. I would imagine the scenario for the specific game, we'll get that. Um, units never start over stacked, start full strength, unless noted otherwise, etc. cetera. Uh, how to do cumulative effects, you know, if I'm half for terrain, half for supply, then I'm quartered. And retrain fractions until your end of the process. Now there is this, this is big um, to understand. Odds are rounded up or down based on, you know, if you're 0.01 to 0 0.49, if I'm if I'm like, uh, when I do the odds ratio between my combat factors and I get, uh, you know, 2.49 to 1, whatever, that rounds down to 2 to 1. But if I get 2.5 to 1, this is the big one. Normal games, it keeps rounding down. No, this game, 2.5 to 1 rounds up to 3 to 1. So this is something to keep in mind here. Retain fractions until final application. Okay, so it's a it's a hard and fast rounding. You know, if you're 0.49 and below, you go down. If you're 0.5 and above, so if I want to get a 3 to 1 against, uh, let's say, two factors, uh, if I can get to 5 to 2, that is 3 to 1, as opposed to normally we're used to 5 to 2 being 2 to 1, always rounding down. So this is, this is a big one. Um, so let's come down here, and we get the symbology here. Attack, defense, movement. That's pretty standard. We get some uh, information here about how big it is. Standard. Give you a nice breakdown here. Platoon, company, battalion, regiment. Got some stuff in between. All pretty standard stuff here. Um, this is unique here. This yellow exploit, yellow box, means it can exploit. You'll see there's an exploit uh, phase for additional movement. Um, we got out of supply, turn record. So, and again, remember this is generic to the series here. <coughs> now, fog of war, which can't really simulate solo. I can selective amnesia maybe. Except when calculating odds for an actual attack committed to, a player can't look at an enemy stack. Uh, can only look at the top marker. Um, so, player cannot cancel an attack after announcing it. So, I can't see what's in your stack under the first counter unless I move up and say I am attacking. And then I can go and look at what's in your stack, but I can't say, oops, that's too many, I'm not attacking. Um, gonna be kind of tough to simulate solo, uh, but it's not a deal breaker. Here's the standard game turn sequence, and we're gonna see it's modified by North Africa's series rules, but uh, pretty straightforward. Movement, combat, exploitation units with this. And there's rules about exploitation. And there is an overrun capability. And then we check supply at the end of the turn. So that's interesting. Um, zones of control, only units with a printed attack strength, not barrage, supply, or defense, of one or more have a zone of control. Good to know here. So if there's some units out there that are zero attack and then a defense, I think German anti-tank units, they don't have a zone of control. So that's something to remember here. Um, and the zone of control only extends into hexes the unit could move into. So here's your example. Um, this unit could move across the bridge, so the Zoc does extend there. But the unit cannot cross, I'm assuming this is a river, prohibited. Therefore, its Zoc does not extend there. Kind of common sense there. <coughs> Play, pay plus two MPs to enter hex in a Zoc. Units that begin in e -Zoc cannot overrun. Okay, units that begin the exploitation phase in EZOC cannot move. Restraining a, uh, a effect there. 
Uh, you can only attack units in your Zoc. So this guy couldn't attack anybody right there. Um, remove one step. If you have to retreat through Ezox, uh, they lose one step. And we'll see later if uh, that can be negated. <coughs> uh, do not inhibit advance after combat. They do block supply lanes. Kind of standard fare here. Uh, I think I covered all that. Coming down here. Multiple Ezox. Friendly units negate Ezox in their hexes for supply purposes only. That's important to know. That means that this retreat, even if there's a friendly unit there, it does not negate the Ezoc. Okay, so that's another thing here <coughs> to note that's slightly different than what we're used to with standard rules. And then they kind of give you an example here of movement. Um, so like this armored unit here is crossing a stream, plus one. So, so you got one, two, three, and then it moves here for four, but that's a Zoc, so you add two more, five, six. And then if we look at um, Woods as two, we get to eight. And pretty much that's it. You got a nine movement. Um, this one, for example, one, two, three. Um, and then we can move at the road movement right here. But we do play plus two for this. I don't see anything in here about moving from Zoc to Zoc. So I'm assuming you can as long as you have enough movement points. Yep, here it is. I should have highlighted this. There it is. Units can move directly from Ezoc to Ezoc. So we are seeing already out of the gate some uh, differences. You know, just to start with the rounding rule here, uh, the Ezoc's on retreat. I can move from Ezoc to Ezoc. That's different than what we'd expect with standard games here. Um, this is all. Player can always move a unit with an MA movement allowance greater than zero, one hex. So there is our one hex rule at least. Okay. Except for prohibited terrain, obviously. Uh, we got the road. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Uh, a hex side feature cross that is not negated by a road adds its cost. Yep. Okay. Restrictions on movement. Can't enter enemy occupied hexes. Overrun is done from adjacent. Uh, map edge is a hard boundary. Can't retreat. Stacking, we'll see, is per game. We'll have its own stacking limit. And we'll see in the North Africa, it does specify when stacking limits apply. There are no roadblocks or road, whatever we want to call it, road jams or traffic jams in this game. Um, we'll see later because stacking is not applied until the end of movement. Uh, reinforcements can overstack initially, but must break up. We'll see those rules for that, too. Uh, if you're overstacked after a cheating, you don't have to kill it off until the end of the next friendly movement phase. That's good. Game markers don't count. Order of stacking. Uh, range of stacks in any way it likes, but the top unit in every stack must have an attack strength of one or more. And you do see with the Fog of War you could use that to hide stronger units under weaker units, but you can't put a zero attack strength unit at the top if you have any that are. Uh, I don't think I'll really be worrying about that in my solo game. Can't delay reinforcements. Ezox have no effect on a placement. We'll see overstack rules for that later. Any hex within 10 hexes along the map edge if you're blocked. Um, here's overrun combat. Two MP cost units can conduct overrun during the movement or <coughs> exploitation phases. And only exploit capable units can do it, obviously, during that phase, only if they didn't start in a Zoc. Uh, and it can only be a stack. You can't pull in multiple units. They've all got to be stacked together. And if you're in an Ezoc starting of the movement or uh, exploitation phase, you can't do it. So normally it's going to be uh, exploit capable units uh, right behind the front lines that do it. Spend two, they move adjacent, uh, paying this adjacent, okay, the player adjacent to the target hex, paying this adjacent hex's terrain cost and any Ezoc cost, so you move up normally, but then you say, okay, I'm expending two MPs and doing an overrun, calculates the odds, rolls the dice, if all defending units vacate the target hex, the overrun units must enter it. 
Um, overruns are resolved in the defender's hex at all times. The attacking and defending are in adjacent, so that it's not really putting them in the hex. More than one stack can never do it. Um, two or less MPs to enter in regular movement. And that's an interesting one. If I'm going to a hex that costs more than two MP, well, I don't see any here, then I can't overrun. Okay, that's something to understand here. Can only overrun, can overrun only once in a phase? Oh, and you can only, the hex can only be overrun once. Uh, units in that hex can be overrun if they retreat to another hex yet to be overrun, so you can keep doing it. Properly managed, a unit can attack up to three times in a turn. Yeah, movement phase, overrun, combat phase, attack. Exploitation phase, if available to move, overrun again. Can't use roads <laughs> when you're overrunning. That makes sense, so this is uh, pretty good. And then we've got, an, again, another good example here of um, an overrun, uh, which we can unpack later. And then uh, overrun attackers can advance after combat. But regardless of the result, that's the end of regular movement for them. There you go. It's not like you can keep moving and overrunning, moving and overrunning. Um, you can overrun during the movement phase. And then if you're still adjacent and they've retreated, you can attack, maybe destroy them. And then the exploitation phase, move again and overrun again. Um, other than overruns during movement, it, combat only occurs during the combat phase. Uh, never forced to attack. Bingo. Um, units must defend if attacked, obviously. Stacks always defend together. Uh, only one hex. Can't do multi-hex defenders. Okay, that's good to know. Some games you can do that. Um, attacks in any desired order. Don't need to. It, don't need to. There's no need to, you know, do all attacks in advance. If one doesn't go well, you cancel other attacks. You can change that. Okay, you just do them one by one. Um, to announce the uh, reveals all the units involved in the attack, then the defender reveals their defending units, and the defender, depending on the special rules, the defender may be able to do something um, during that process. We'll pack that out when we play the game. <coughs> Combat results table, number of steps lost, uh, number of hexes to be retreated. Okay, so... Got that. A result of A1, R1 would mean attacker must lose one step and retreat one hex. Attacking force must lose a total of one step. Strongest unit first uses loses the first step. And then they must retreat. Um, defender always executes first. Okay. Now we can have units in a stack attack different hexes. Only attack once for a phase. One overrun attack in a phase. We've seen that here. I think there's something important. Sort of losses advance after units with a printed attack strength of zero can participate in an attack um, mainly to absorb losses. Well, they add nothing. Units can absorb step losses and advance after combats. Okay. But it looks like the strongest unit first. Attacking force must use a total of one stop, strongest unit, and all attacking units must retreat one. Okay. So I think, yep, I missed something here. So there's even order of applying losses. Uh, then we got terrain effects, and they're pretty much defined in the terrain effects chart. We have both the hex you're in and the hex side. So three units are attacking across the stream and one isn't, the three would be at one half, and the last would be normal. This is important, though. Some games, they say, if you only have at least one unit not attacking across the stream or river, then everybody attacks at full strength. No. Uh, if you're attacking across the stream in this case, any unit doing that is halved. Any unit not uh, is not halved. Uh, let's see. Odds determination. Compare the defense, divide both by a smaller number. Apply the rounding rule. There we go. That's that rule I pointed out earlier. Okay. Um, 
basically up to 0.49, round down, 0.5 or above, round up. <clears throat> Left in the left most column, incur the following. The attacker loses one step and the defender is unaffected. Okay, the reason they're saying this is if you're doing fog of war, you could inadvertently attack a hex and realize, you know, the odds are way off the chart. Standard rounding rule should be clear. This is far from usual round in favor of the defender. That's what we're used to. That's not true. Examples, three to four is one to one. Okay, because that's, I don't know how to do that. That's 0.75, and that's above 0.5, so it rounds up to one to one. Five to two, normally we say is two to one, but no, that's actually um, 2.5 to one, and 0.5 rounds up to three to one. And then 9 to 6 is 2 to 1, interestingly enough, because it gets you uh, over 0.5. And then 11 to 8 is 1 to 1. So you have to do a little math. Maybe actually do the division. Uh, 9 over 6 is 3 over 2, which is uh, 1.3. Okay, that rounds up to 2 to 1. And then 11 to 8. So keep that in mind. Oh, here we go. Step losses. Most units have a full and reduced strength. They're flipped over. Reduced strength to take it are destroyed. Um, yep, that's pretty straightforward here. Full strength side is stronger than two. Yeah, the only question I have is it looks like the strongest unit must take. When the result calls for a step loss, the first step loss must be from the side's strongest unit, highest printed attack strength, or highest printed defense strength. And then everybody must uh, get one step loss before we start eliminating units. So here are the big two. That's what I was looking for. That's how you do step losses. So we're seeing some tweaks here from what we're used to um, in uh, other games. <coughs> Retreats, number of hexes. Uh, let's say hey, units with one step are eliminated. Into or through hexes the unit could move through. Can't go into prohibited. Units which cannot retreat or continue their retreat must lose one step per hex that they cannot retreat. The only player selects the units. Okay, retreat is always in hexes. Any hex containing an Ezoc front here, here it is. That's another difference there. There are some tweaks here. This loss is in addition to the combat result. Total per Ezoc. Um... This loss is in addition to the result. A stack must lose one step total. It's not each unit. unit. They can stay together, go to separate paths. Unit must retreat towards the supply source. There's our kind of driving our retreat path here. Um, a unit may avoid Ezox even if doing so violates room 91C. Yeah, but it does. At all costs, you can avoid Ezox. But a player can convert. Any retreat amount into step losses is one step per hex. That's good to know. So if you get an R3, you could do retreat 3, or you could do one step loss, retreat 2, or retreat 1 and do two step losses, or absorb all three. And uh, I think this is per stack also. Advance after combat. If the defender retreats further than one hex, only exploit-capable units can advance as many hexes as the defender. Hmm. Sounds like Battle for the Ardennes. The advance after combat is equal to the original result. Original hex must be the first one, but after that they can go anywhere they want, except for enemy unit hexes and prohibitive. They ignore Ezox. That's different, okay. Attacker can advance or treat results number of attacks. Yeah, if it destroys the defender, then the attacker can advance or retreat results number of hexes. Defenders cannot advance after combat. Exploitation, only units with a yellow box can do it, and they cannot be an Ezoc. Yeah, they get us, otherwise units which are ex not exploit capable can't do it. So basically it's just another movement phase, second impulse. Let me talk about supply here. Phasing player determines if people are in supply. Otherwise marks them with an out of supply. Supply line free of enemy units or Ezox, but friendly units do negate. 
generally a contiguous hex. We'll see each rule has specific rules in North Africa. Uh, they are in supply until the next complete supply phase. So that's the only time you check it. Um, and each game has their different uh, effects here. Yeah, game rules specific for out of supply. And how do you gain? Pretty much you have to occupy the hex to get control. And that's it, seven pages. Seven pages of standard rules, but uh, I may go back and write these down. But there are tweaks in here from what we're used to, or clarifications, starting with the rounding rule, zone of control effects, ability to retreat through ESOX. Um, so it behooves one to uh, note the differences from the standard there. Okay, so and then uh, got some good uh, examples of play, designer's notes, good stuff. Okay. Then we move on to, let's see what we're doing. Oh, wow, this is long, but let's do it. Uh, North Africa rules. Um, okay, remember, an ESOC is only exerted by units that have a one or more combat attack strength. But a combat unit in general is defined as, as any printed attack or defense. Stacking limit is four. That's it right there. Four combat units per hex. Um, unit step losses have no effect. We're not counting steps or anything. It's flat four units. Uh, the stacking limit must be applied at the end of any activation. This is unique to North Africa. We activate within a turn, multiple activations. So at the end of an activation, stacking limits are checked. Movement, moment of an attack or overrun. Okay, yeah. Got to make sure you're not overstacked. And there's a pass um, activation, so you still got to make sure your units <coughs> meet the stacking limits. If you exceed them, then you must eliminate excess, but only at these points of time. There are units on the game here that have an X through them. I think that X means, there you go, see the white X's through those units. That means that they're eliminated, they can't be rebuilt. And that makes sense, that's the armor units there. Um, this other X means something else, but yeah, supply units. Um, and then we got supply sources. We'll see that set up during the scenario. Scale five miles per hex. Each turn is one month. What? But the activations are one to two days of high intensity activity. So this is what North Africa is going to do. Um, like the first scenario we play is only one turn, but we're going to have multiple activations back and forth. So Potentially, it plays out like multiple turns. Um, the maps, there is a Tobruk bypass. I don't think Tobruk's on my map, but it becomes a primary road. Apparently, they built it up on October 41. To protect the Italians, we have an access safe zone. Wow. It means the Commonwealth can't attack units here. So you can't really illuminate the Italians totally. That'll be interesting to wrestle with. Okay. Terrain key again, I mean, unit symbol key, I think it's the same. And then here they give us, of course, what each of these are. Army, armor, assault gun, light armor, cav, arm cav, motorcycles, armored cars, camel cavalry. Yeah, only in North Africa. Infantry mech, airborne, frontier border guards, territorial info, etc. Anti-tank, machine gun, engineer. Looks like in general these units are battalion strength based on this. Um, and then some other markers here, perhaps unique to North Africa, like the activated, not activated, rebuilds. We got minefields, fortifications. Uh, this is disorganized. I think that is standard, though. Who has control? That's good. And there's that non rebuild, -rebuild unit. Um, yep. And airstrikes. I guess that's both sides. I do not know what Arco di Fileni is, but it's this has an unlimited stack limit, so it must be some staging area. Uh, Tobruk, there's rules. You can pull reinforcements in there. Uh, in certain conditions are met, you can transfer quickly to Tobruk, <coughs> and you can even ship units to Tobruk. That's both sides, but there's a die roll involved when you're doing that. Um, you kind of see it here, roll one die. On a roll of three to six, a player can place one unit in Tobruk. Uh, and this is for shipping. Here, you roll one D6 for transfer. If you've got a primary road into it, it's not besieged. 
and you can transfer that number of units or half that number of units for the uh, axis. Control markers, we talked about that. Um, yeah, combat multiple, single best here. Uh, here's the sequence of play, and this is now unique, this whole <coughs> activation to North Africa. That's how we can have one turn being a month, but lots of activity going on, and you're going to see this is driven by how much supply the side has. It. So you may get periods of inactivity, followed by brief bursts of activity, and then back to inactivity. So if we look at the sequence of play, uh, I think random events is only the campaign game, then reinforcements if you've got a multi-turn scenario you'll see the first few scenarios are just one turn then initiative and basically initiative determination the player just you know that player can go first in the activation phase or say let's make this an inactive turn if the turn gets tagged as inactive both sides don't want to spend supply points to do something potentially <clears throat> they can at least do admin movement and then right down to the cleanup phase but if it becomes an air active turn um, then we've got airstrikes, and we decide on activations. And it's alternated, starting with the unit who has initiative. Uh, and if you want to do a full activation, two supply units, and I think we got some right here. So it looks like it's all about supply here. And if you do a full activation, overruns movement and overruns combat, exploitation, okay, disorganize, recovery, remove expended supply units. So basically you can do everything this looks like an SCS turn right here okay now if you want to do a limited activation only expend one supply you can do movement overrun you can do combat you just can't do exploitation okay it's good to know one supply and you can also do a reaction activation if the previous phase the enemy player did a I believe a full or a limited you can say I'm reacting and all you can do is movement, but you don't burn a supply point. Or you can say pass and don't do anything, and then it goes back to the other. And if you do two passes, one player does a pass and then the next player does a pass, we come down to the cleanup phase. <coughs> Here's our supply. So all during this time, units can just run. I mean, they don't have to be in supply, actually. Well, I think there's a rule saying you can't activate unless you're in supply, so there is that limit. But here's our supply. Um, at the end, we've got a rebuild capability for those units. We can do it. <clears throat> we can build forts and minefields pretty much by burning supply. And then we go to the next turn marker. So this is the heart of the game. And this is looks like driven by supply. Uh, so you do see this is critical um, here. And this could be who knows. And, that, <clears throat> and potentially in a single turn, if I did you know a full, a limited, a full, a reaction... All my units could move during all of these, okay, as long as they fit the rules to be activated. Um, there's random events for campaign, <coughs> reinforcements, yeah, you place them, but of course this is North Africa, and Churchill at least liked to pull units from here to send to other fronts, and we see removals, we see exchanging units for other units, um, the number of supply units you get for the turn is listed, and the Greek campaign. Some units have to go away, and then potentially some of them come back at the end of the Greek campaign. <clears throat> I think that's that's kind of a big effect on the Commonwealth, and here we go, I call it the Churchill effect here. Rolls during the reinforcement phase in campaign games, when required, CW withdrawal, so even what they withdraw <coughs> can be randomized, I think, beyond the Greek campaign. <coughs> um, so the CW, you never know. Tripoli Cup, I think this is Italians. You can put a number of units in that cup and then uh, draw a number. <coughs> Each turn in the reinforcement phase, draw a number of units from the Tripoli Cup equal to the number of access supply units. <coughs> Excuse me. Arriving that turn. Okay. So there you see some variable there. And then some CW units end up in training. So that's kind of more involved than just get reinforcements and that's it. Initiative, two dice, player with the higher number wins, re-roll, ties. <coughs> and then uh, right out of the box, the initiative player can say, I want to do an active turn if the other player agrees. They basically do an admin movement and they move to the next turn. 
Oh, we see it right there. <clears throat> then they talk about what's admin movement. Um, can't enter an EZOC unless already occupied by friendly units. Triple their MA. Okay, that's where you get those large movement factors. Like this unit can move 33 and the other one can move 27. Must end their move in supply. That's a big one. Can't go further than your furthest advanced unit. Eastward for the axis, westward. <clears throat> so, you know, if the enemy leaves the door open, you can't use admin movement to just drive down the coast for the Germans and take Alexandria. <clears throat> um, I think that's that. Uh, <clears throat> units that begin the phase in EZOC cannot use. There it is again. <clears throat> you see that EZOC is a restraining influence on admin and exploitation movement. And you don't have to use or expend supply units um, to do admin movement. And this is the one time they can move, too. So you need to position your supply units during this. <clears throat> airstrike, the number of airstrikes available is determined by the turn record chart, which says that's how many dice you get. And you divide, the, divide it by two, round it up. <clears throat> and that's the number of the airstrikes. Okay. There's an air surge random event that could occur, which adds a dice. Okay. And it's airstrikes that uh, you're kind of like artillery barrages. They can disorganize units. <clears throat> Activations. Um, full or limited activations, remove uh, expended supply units. Oh, at the end of each full or limited activation, remove the supply units that you expended, disorganize markets on any friendly units, and if you used any activation. So full and limited are the big ones. And we do see what we saw before. Very similar <coughs> reaction. Only if the preceding enemy activation that turn was full or limited. Uh, reaction allows all stacks within 10 or less hexes of a chosen combat unit to move and nothing else. Okay. Uh, let's see, general rules here. I think this is going to be similar to other games. Artillery barrages and airstrikes can disorganize the unit, which then, until it's removed, they're at half attack, half defense. Half movement, no Zoc. That's a big one. Um, and at the end of any full or limited activation, you remove them. Here are the supply rules. Uh, units unable to trace supply needed for an activation simply don't activate. They're not marked without a supply like we do in that supply trace phase. To be in supply, you must be able to trace to one of the following a supply source a primary road that goes to a supply source, or a friendly expan uh, unexpended supply unit. So those are our sources. Uh, the distance allowed is 10 hexes. Now that 10 hexes could be to the supply source, 10 hexes to the supply unit, or up to 10 hexes to the primary road connected to a supply source. And I think that's that there. Uh, yeah, okay, exception. Supply trace during an activation only, not in the supply phase. This is interesting. Ignore enemy combat units and unnegated EZOCs. So if I'm just tracing supply for the purpose of deciding if I can activate, not during the actual supply phase, just can I activate? I just have to, I can ignore enemy units and EZOCs for that because they only represent one to two days and units had enough supply. This, I think, is more just within orders range. So that's an interesting tweak there. Um, Oasis give you units in supply, but they're considered out of supply for an activation. If you are out of supply, it's really no effect except you roll for surrender. Well, that's a scary effect, but no other effects in the stack need not be marked as out of supply. Good. Basically, during the supply trace phase, if you come to find out during that end phase portion, you're units out of supply, you roll to see if they are surrendered. And then they can potentially be rebuilt. Here's our supply units. 
only move during an activation by tracing to an expended supply unit. So here's the bottom line. To move supply units, uh, pretty much they can only move mainly during the admin movement phase. Um, but if for whatever reason you had to move them during an actual activation because maybe they're out of position, you advanced too far in the previous one, who knows, um, then you got to do a full or limited uh, activation and the supply unit will move like any other activated unit. Um, and they could be the one you're expending too. We're going to work that out in the game. Uh, you can't capture supply units, so if you do move into a hex with an enemy supply unit, you roll on this dice. On this, one to three, eliminate it. Four to six, put the supply unit in any friendly combat unit hex, which can trace supply. So, 50-50 chance the supply unit is destroyed. Otherwise, it's reclaimed. We've got some rebuild cups, three of them. One for the CW, one for the German Luftwaffe units, German and Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe units, and one for the Italians, and as long as it doesn't have a white X on it, it can be rebuilt. And here we see the 7th Armored units can't be rebuilt. The Armored cars apparently can. So, each rebuild point allows one random draw from the cup of the same type, or recover two units to full strength. So, basically worth two steps. Each rebuild point is two steps to completely rebuild a destroyed unit or um, you know units that have flipped bring them back up. Two units to full strength. I wonder if it's a white crossed unit if I can rebuild it. That's probably your first priority. So like if uh, one of these units was down one step I would make them a priority to rebuild again because I know if they lose another step they will be gone forever. Got to be in supply to re build up to full strength at the moment. So you do have to check supply when you're doing activations or rebuilding. Um, and some other things, better note those. Going to have to go through the rules and make some notes here. Barrages, artillery barrages. Um, basically, and it's similar to airstrikes. Okay, the barrage process is the same. Announce the barrage and its type and roll one die for the target hex. Add one if it's a fort. If it's less than or equal to the artillery or airstrike rating, the hex is disorganized. Good to know. And if you do get it disorganized, you can make another one die roll against the stack. And if you get a five or six, it also inflicts one step loss. So barrages in general, you say I'm doing a barrage, then you got to say is it an airstrike or artillery. And artillery is determined by your activation. A full activation allows three barrages at the end of the player's movement phase, you must declare. And the target hex must be within five hexes of a current expended supply unit. Okay, good to know. Target hex must be adjacent to a friendly unit for spotting. So, if you want to use an artillery, you got to be within range. Five hexes of the expended artillery unit. So, three artillery barrages expended. Actually, there's two if you're doing a full activation. <coughs> so, I'd imagine the three could be split or done between them. And you got to have a unit next to it spotting. Airstrikes, full activation allows two airstrikes. Um, and, ooh, Axis can do it during their movement and exploitation phase, but uh, only the movement phase for the CW. Target hex must be in five hexes of friendly unit when executed. No more than five. Okay, massive expenditure of ammo, etc. So, basically, if you want artillery, artillery or airstrikes, you're going to have to do a full activation, and then there's an optional rule that tweaks that if you want to do it. Let's see, we got leaders, and uh, they are placed at the beginning. Let's see. Leaders have no movement allowance and do not move like other units. 
All of players will instantly be placed on any stacks containing friendly combat units at the very beginning of each friendly full or limited activation or admin. So one of the first steps you do is the beginning of the movement phase is place your leaders. Once the leader is placed, it must stick with one unit during that movement phase. And then they do give you, I think it's, they give you a column shift, but then you roll on the leader loss table. Play that too. So you always run the risk if you use your leaders for combat that something could happen to them. Okay, so that's leaders, and Rommel is even more special. His stack can overrun in a reaction activation. That's wild. Wow. And supply units stacked with him can move during exploitation. Okay, got to keep that in mind. Watch that Rommel unit. Uh, forts, don't can't build them until January 41. There's forts on the map that are permanent, but you can also build point, forts by expending supply points uh, during the end phase, the cleanup phase. Uh, to build a hex chosen to build a fort must fulfill all the following friendly combat unit there. No more than five hexes to a supply unit, which is removed. And one supply unit can build two forts. Uh, don't already have a fort there, and it's not in a delta or salt marsh. Kind of hard to build forts on that. And if an enemy unit enters that hex, which indicates no friendly units, like maybe advance after combat, it's destroyed. But friend, uh, forts just stay there. Defense strength doubled, can't be overrun, plus one DRM and barrages and airstrikes. We saw that, and it applied. there's no facing. The fort is 360 degrees. Okay, good. Got some minefields, but that you got to wait until January 42. Burn supply points to build minefields. Limited by the counter mix. I think forts are too. Um, you can remove. Okay. Ch must fulfill all of the following. Combat unit occupies or is adjacent to it. Uh, but if it's adjacent, must not be in an EZOC. Five hexes to a supply unit three minefields okay so it looks like two forts three minefields within can't have already have a minefield or a delta or salt marsh and what do minefields do any unit that enters a minefield must stop regardless so first it stops movement and then if you're in the middle of a minefield your combat strength because you're probably out in the open and walking carefully is halved both attack and Defense, and if you retreat into a minefield hex, you lose a step. Yeah, they're not nice. But again, January 42 for that, January 41 for forts. And there are fort units, but that just represents the garrison. Okay. And the last rule here, we are at 50 minutes. Um, if you capture these hexes, you get these supply units. Like if the Germans take Tobruk, they get four supply units. Germans take Benghazi, they get one. Uh, the Brits recover, recapture, they get four. So, but intentionally trading ownership of a hex to milk its capture award is not allowed past third grade. I believe that's sarcasm and a joke. Okay, so I think yeah, we've been through the rules. There's enough here. I'm going to have to go back and make sure we saw the ba the series rules. There's enough tweaks from what we're used to. you got to be careful. And then, of course, these rules for North Africa do change the base SCS rules now. The whole concept of activations is a big one. Um, some optional rules if you want to use it. Uh, we got recon screens. And I think what this basically boils down to is they can retreat before combat. So they can delay, unaffected by artillery barrages, but affected by airstrikes. And you can voluntarily retreat up to twice per phase. So you can, uh, kind of like skirmishers and Napoleonics. Um, airstrikes, limited activation. Okay, starting in 41, you could have airstrikes on limited activations. Um, for a full activation, all units must trace to both supply units used at the same time. This is pretty much organizing your supplies. 
Uh, I don't, I'll think about it. There aren't too many here to apply here. Reaction activations. Some of the range for reacting units not to 10 hexes rather than 10 of a chosen combat unit. Reacting units to 2 hexes rather than 10. Hmm. Okay, that'd be interesting. Admin activations. Each player may conduct an admin as an activation during a normal turn, not just during the admin turn. Single admin activation per turn, costing one supply unit. Okay. That's interesting. And then we go to the scenarios. All right, so that is our tour of the rules. And like I said, we're going to do Operation Brevity. And it's just map C and one turn. You do know Operation Battle Axe, map C, one turn. Um, let's see what happens down here. Crusader, two turns, B and C, but multiple activations in there. A lot of units here. I think that's the scenarios. And then we come here and we get the campaign games. Really? No. This is only two turns. B and C. Gazala. El Alamein, the first battle. Only one turn. Map D. Oh, these are nice little bite-sized games here. And then we've got Operation Compass. Okay. 24 turns. All maps. This looks like a campaign game. And we got uh, 20 turns now. We're working our way in. The Germans arrive to the end. Here's a start point of Crusader. So we only have 13 turns until the end. And here's a Gazala. Seven turns to the end. First El Alamein. Five turns Wow, to the end. Looks like they don't break out. Second El Alamein. And then here we've got all this order of arrival stuff, which we won't need. And then designer's notes for North Africa, good stuff. So we are going to be doing brevity, the first one. So we see here, set up first access initiative player Commonwealth, I guess on the first turn, it is the first turn. Air strikes, CW has three, access has two, no rebuilds, no reinforcements. It's only one turn. Um, here we have actual setup hexes, it looks like. <coughs> Here's the Commonwealth Supply Source, C3701. I do not know how that happened. Uh, 37, yep, right here. That makes sense. And then the uh, access supply source, any road or primary road, entering from the west edge of the map. Oh, it's any of these. Any, what did I say? Any road or primary road. So, boom, 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 boom. Okay, play begins with the activation phase. And I believe the Commonwealth has the initiative. Players controlling Fort Capuzzo, Solemn, and Hafia Pass. Fort Capuzzo, Solemn. There's Solemn. Don't know where Fort Capuzzo is. There's Solemn. There's Hafia Pass. So it looks like it's around here. This is where the battle is. I think there's a hide unit somewhere. Oh, got a oh nice delete DG markers. That's helpful. Uh, Fort's mines help. Notes. Hide all pieces. There's Hafia. There's Solemn. I don't know where Fort Capuzio is. Well, it does say it. Hold on. Fort Capuzio is at 42.29. Um, that's interesting. It's hard to... 42.29. There it is. Capuzio. There it is already there. Haifa Pass. Solemn, 42.28. Okay, so we got to take that one, too. And the Germans have that one. As both hexes adjoining Hyphia Pass, 4028, 4128. Okay, 4028 and 4128. Oops. Oh, it's here. So basically, we're fighting over these hexes here. 
And I don't know who has those. Let's bring the units back. So it looks like this is kind of unoccupied. The Brits are going to go first. And they've got two out of the three. So they probably want to quickly move up here, secure Haifa Pass, and then maybe try and take Solemn against, looks like, anti-tank units of the 15th Panzers, an anti-tank battalion. But then Fort Capuzio will be a little tougher. So the Brits could win just by taking all this. Um, and if neither player controls all of these hexes, it's a draw. Okay, that's straightforward. So this first game, yeah, we're just going to do British, and I'm sure, let's see how many. They can do two full activations or one full activation and two limited activations. Hmm. And then let's look at the Germans. I didn't find any supply units for them. Um, I don't think they have any. That's a problem here. So let's see. Here's supply units. Four. Three. Okay, somewhere, any friendly stack. Okay, we'll have to look for those. But they've got three. So, uh, yeah, the Germans can do one full activation and one limited, or three limited. The Brits can do two fulls, or two, two fulls, two limiteds, or one full and three limiteds, or, well, you can do the math. So that's going to be an interesting play. I'm going to have to set up the supply units, though. I don't know where they are. Yeah, and it's all going to be here. Okay, cool. So that is what we have in front of us. And I'm almost at one hour, but uh, hopefully, uh, if you have never seen the SCS system, now you've been given a relative deep dive to the system as well as the specific rules. And each of the SCS games use the series rules as a foundation, but you do see here that it does make some serious, this whole, you're not going to see this in other SCS games, potentially some other ones, you're going to see this whole activation back and forth. And supply is important, which from what I understand of OCS, supply is very important, and hence we're converting an OCS game, so we have to make supply important here too in the desert. And we'll see when we play how that plays out. Okay. Um, so I'm just shy of 60 minutes. Thank you for your patience if you've gone this long. And as usual, if you like, click like. Comments are greatly appreciated, especially if you have experience with this system and or this game. Let me know if I got anything wrong or any comments you have. And of course, subscribe if you haven't already. So we will see you at the next recording when we will be plunging into Operation Brevity. Thanks for listening.